Listen up and wise up. Roy wants young shots to learn from his mistakes. It is very, very scary. I didn't realise how much damage I had done. Early birds. It's an early morning delivery of pheasant poults for our modern gamekeeper, Paul. The circle starts again. And continuing with our public service broadcasting, we have tips to keep your working dogs safe and sound. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Seriously? Can't hear that? Can't hear a thing yet. It is, it is very, very scary. Um, I didn't realise how much damage yeah. I had done. I always, I, I've known for a while that I probably was a little bit deaf. Yep. He is actually ringing it. <laughs> oh, seriously? This is something that, that a lot of shooters are actually going to face, but you're facing it at 47. I heard that. <laughs> Heroically, Roy is illustrating what years of shotgun and rifle shooting has done to his hearing. The bell Charlie's ringing would normally Something be attached there. to a falcon or hawk to locate the bird in the field. You'll never be attacked by Morris dancers. No, really? Not wrong. No, you'll, ne you'll never hear the Morris dancers. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Are you ringing it? By the time you hear them, they'll be punching you in the face. Are you ringing it, really? No. There, there. <laughs> Yeah. I've been ringing it the whole time, though. Go on then, with my eyes open. No. That, that is seriously scary. It just looks like you're waving your hand at me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is odd. Just seeing it, or just hearing it. Yeah, I mean, that, that I've just, I'm just not picking up that at all. Experiences that. So whether you've had hearing aids before or you're completely brand new to them, it's the way your brain After that worrying together. demonstration, it's time to meet Mumtaz Nakfi of Essex so Hearing Care. Giving it the correct information, those hair cells that are working in your cochlea are just working harder now. There's a right and a, and a left side. She's been assessing Roy's hearing and today she's come with his shiny new hearing aids. They're not something you want to be buying in your early 40s, especially if the damage to your hearing is self-inflicted. Plane, a plane taking off is at 90, so I've lost four kilohertz up to just, just below it. Yeah. This graph shows a sharp decline in Roy's hearing at higher frequencies in both his ears. He can't hear birdsong, drills and, unchecked, the sound of a plane during takeoff could soon be a struggle. Compare this to Montaz's and you can see there's a huge difference. One important thing to bear in mind is that the longer you leave it before getting a hearing aid, the more sounds you'll lose. Ignoring the problem means the brain forgets sounds and they're permanently wiped from your memory banks. If you have a hearing loss or any difficulties, the longer you leave it, the harder it is then for your brain to get used to that signal right. because it's going, I, I've not heard it for such a long time. Um, hence why seeing people, and unfortunately I have where there's people I've known for who've had a hearing loss for 20 plus years and they've not done anything um, and then they've come back and gone right I, I need to do something now it's it's a bit ridiculous but their understanding their cognitive abilities deteriorated to such such an extent that it's very very difficult to even with the best hearing aid in the world to give them you know the best result essentially so yeah so what we're looking at then if you if you if you are thinking or, or you know if you, if you think you have damaged your hearing or you think you are losing it then the best thing to do is, is go and get tested yeah do you think you, your hearing loss has been to such an extent that you could have actually been wearing a hearing aid in your 30s? Definitely, yeah. I, yeah I've definitely lost. I, yeah. In my 30s, yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> the arguments were starting that I wasn't listening to conversations or not paying attention. It could just be that I'm ignorant, but um, yeah, I've, I hope not. But no, I think I think definitely. I think it, it was it was something or it's something that has been. Um, damage for a long time and, and progressively getting worse. So I think it's definitely something that I would have benefited from um, and I should have got tested at a, a much earlier date. Thankfully, it's not a case of too little too late. 
Roy still has enough audio cues in his brain for the hearing aid to work its magic. However, this is not about making do. It's about telling others to do something now. So prevention is far better than cure. I mean, if you had to tell him again, you would be worrying. Oh, 100%. There's no way I would have been that much of an idiot. Um, yeah, as I say, it was... You know, I can think of countless, countless, countless times where, um, you know, just going, yeah, rabbiting with friends and stuff like that, and you, you get a little bit of tinnitus afterwards, you get that, that ringing in your ears. Um, you, you, you continually do that. Um, eventually, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take its toll. You are not immune. It will happen to you if you oh, have yeah. regular exposure to shotguns and even moderated rifles. So, don't be like Lupton. Wear protection. If you would like a hearing aid consultation and you are in the Essex area, drop Mum a line. Inquiries at essexhearingcare.co.uk. Typically, your ears, obviously, they're the same age, they've gone through the same... Deaf as a post and so avoidable. Take note, one and all. Now from Mutt and Jeff to, well, just Muttley. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. It's going to be a poor year for grouse numbers. Moorland gamekeeper Richard Bailey came hot foot from helping to put out the wildfires of Saddleworth Moor to speak to Charlie in the Carter Jonas Game Fair Theatre. Usually it's the weather, too wet weather, um, but this year has been the reverse. We had a very good spring, hatched off very well, but the prolonged dry weather has you know, put pay to kind of grouse prospects. This year we're just getting through our counts and it doesn't look brilliant. Charlie chatted to 50 guests on the theatre stage over the weekend of the game fair and grouse was a popular topic. Other moorland gamekeepers and grouse shooting agents at the game fair told the same story for grouse all over the country. The BBC's Radio News flagship show came to the game fair this year. The Today programme took over the theatre tent on the Saturday morning of the show and of course Martha Carney could not talk about shooting without bringing in an anti. Speaking up in favour of grouse shooting, Rachel Carey met anti-hunting activist Georgia Locott head to head on science. So it seems, um, Rachel, that, uh, that Georgia's accepting your point about lapwings, but it's the birds of prey that she's particularly and concerned about. And it's the bigger picture as well. The highest breeding success of all of the species you talk about, including hen harriers, um, have actually taken place on moors managed for grouse shooting. Rachel put in a strong performance. In the new president of Ireland could be a master of foxhounds. Irish presidential hopeful and former Dragon's Den judge Gavin Duffy is a member of the Louth Hunt, has been chairman of the Hunting Association of Ireland and supports stag hunting. The election takes place in November 2018 at the latest. Current president Michael Higgins is seeking re-election and Sinn Féin intends to field a candidate. A distinguished Pakistani actress has fallen foul of the world's antis after speaking proudly about going big game hunting with her husband. Jahan Ara was speaking on the popular Hamari Mehmam show on Ari News. She talked about tiger and leopard hunting and how she drove the jeep while her husband followed up a wounded animal. And finally, a Norwegian polar bear guard whose job it is to protect people from polar bears has been criticised for shooting a polar bear after it attacked a man. The bear attacked and injured another polar bear guard who was leading tourists off a cruise ship on the Arctic archipelago of Svalbard. The other guard shot the animal. Actor and anti-hunter Ricky Gervais called the guards morons. Thanks to Steve Kearney for sending in the story. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now the shooting season is just around the corner and this week, Paul Childerly gets his birds. <laughs> For the past few months, gamekeepers have been under starter's orders. Now they're off the blocks and running. This time of year, you sort of go from like being quite nice and relaxed to like 100 mile an hour, so. Yeah, he thinks about next week before you start today, so. The birds rule the roost, or the gamekeeper's soul anyway. It's exciting, but it's also, um, <laughs> it's like, 
the circle starts again. From here on in and for the rest of 2018, it's all about, and nothing but about, the birds. The seven-week-old pheasants are here this week for a reason. Timing is everything. Well, price is too. But for today, let's talk about timing. We don't shoot pheasants until November. Um, we start on the partridges, so we don't need early, early pheasants. Other years, we have had them in, <coughs> in June, uh, end of June, July. But then, obviously, they mature quicker, over the pen wire quicker, um, out into the crops, and um, you get a bit more wandering. And also, when they, when they get out then, you've got you know, a problem with the foxes and whatnot, and you can't get on top of the foxes because the crops are still up. So, um, this year, we had them right at the end of July, um, beginning of August. They're still you know, mid-birds, they're not late birds, but it just gives a bit more time to get on top of the vermin. We move to another pen which has been prepped by Sam, Paul's new young keeper. Perfect. Are you excited this time of year? Yeah, I am, yeah, yeah. I think, I think yeah, about every keeper's a, a mixture of excitement and a little bit nervous, but oh, here we go again, um, as Paul said earlier. So, yeah, generally excited about um, getting ready for getting ready for the start of shooting this so have year. You, it? Have you got enough sleeping in the last uh, Months then to see yeah. you through. Yeah, yeah, it's stockpiling it, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stop no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> While Paul's been away, he has been responsible for getting the hoppers filled with Marsden's Growers Pellets 2.5 and getting the water system working properly. Last week's just been really getting all, making sure the hoppers are in the pens, make sure they're all ready, filling them all up with food, and then, of course, filling header tanks up. Um, which here we don't have mains water to the pens. We've got everything's bowsed out, so um, that's been the trip back and forwards with the bowser. Um, find the leak, another trip with the bowser, dogging out the pens as well. And we've got a lot of deer here, so um, you get a lot of deer in the pens, so we've been having to push them out. So, what would be a problem if you had a munchak in there? That's, that's not going to disturb them, is it? Yeah, basically, what happens is they'll all, the first few nights, they won't all go to roost the first few nights, so they'll all find a a corner and it's probably on this pen they see they can fly easily out onto this, this wheat field here so what they probably do tonight what they always do every year is they all jug which is basically all sit together all on the front here inside the pen and then basically if you get a muntjac that's trying to get out of the pen here one round edge of the and pen wire trying to get out and he's bashing against the pen wire make that noise or run through them they'll all run to each other get spooked panic will set in and they'll just fly up and, and you'll get a spillage over the top onto this corn or into the ditches and stuff and of course Mr Foxy comes along and just wipes them up. Tom Howe supplies the birds this morning from Fen Game. It's his crazy season. So the busiest time of the year for you? Then? Yeah, it is now, yeah. yeah. Um, we start delivering um, poults early June and um, still got a lot to move this month, so... How many birds? Can you give me an idea? What, to move or...? <laughs> yeah, to move. Um, I'd say we've still probably got about 120,000 to move. Okay. Yeah. So. But is this, is this the, sort of the keenest time of year? Most, most people are getting the birds in? Or yeah, what? yeah. Um, it yeah, was probably another um, another three weeks on pheasants, then we, we start on partridges then. Yeah. Um, once the, the crops have been cut, um, people are more, more keen to take the partridges in then once the, the crops have been cut. Breakdown of, of time of year and what sort of happens over, um, over the season for you. Basically, we start um, we start putting the laying hens in in position uh, end of February, beginning of March, and then um, on a normal year, probably not so much this year, just gone. But on a normal year, it's nothing not to see start getting eggs end of March, early April, um, and then uh, chick wise, we'll have chicks on the field end of April and then just a roll-on effect, really. There needs to be continuity between the rearing fields and going to wood. So basically they're on the exactly the same rations they're on when they're at the game farm, so there's no stress of changeover of food. What we're trying to do is make everything the same, really, so same type of drinkers, so they recognise the drinkers, same type of feeders, same type of food. Um, they just haven't got no, no pen wire on over top of them, just on the outside of them. 
is this sort of where your stress ends and the gamekeepers begins? As well, we've got a shoot of our own, so we start shooting um, second week of September. So we uh, <laughs> we roll off the back of this straight into that uh, You're until a for punishment until the first of February. So we're we're always busy. What's one of the biggest issues you have with with this job? Labour. <laughs> <laughs> Finding labour. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. The right the right labour. Um, you know, you can you can employ anybody, but uh, the thing is, with livestock, if it's not managed and maintained and looked after properly, then you've soon got dead stock. So it's you know the the right person who wants to do it um, and has got enthusiasm for the job, rather than just turning up as a job, really. To be honest, it's intensive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah um, no, it's, it's fairly full on. The welfare of the birds and the success of the shoot is now firmly on the shoulders of Paul and Sam and in the next episode of Modern Gamekeeper we'll be back to see how they do. Thank you Paul, the pressure is on. Now just as Paul looks after his investment so should you, here's how to keep your dog safe from thieves. Beautiful dogs at work. We train them, we treasure them, and almost everyone in the shooting community knows someone who has had them stolen. What can you do? We talk to the founder of a voluntary organisation that recovers lost dogs. Jane Hayes says that this year it is happening more than ever. She has good advice on security for anyone who owns a dog. Unfortunately, we're seeing a rise in dog theft at the moment and mostly working dogs, especially Cocker Spaniels. Well, basically, we've got a trained dog and at the moment, field sports is getting very popular and we're getting a lot of people taking up shooting. Now, they don't mind paying £5,000 on a gun and they're going to pay the same on a good gun dog, but they don't have time to train it. So they're buying them on performance and not questioning where these dogs have come from. So we've had several dogs being stolen actually on shoots and they leave them in the car, maybe to rest one and they're taking another dog out. Uh, people are aware, you know, you're going to have, a shoot is going to have trained gun dogs. That's what they want, trained gun dogs, because that's what they get a lot of money for. People are leaving their dogs outside in kennels and they're building the kennels to keep the dogs in instead of trying to keep the thieves out. Some of them just use chicken wire and that's so easy to cut through. And also, some of them got some really good cages, but they're putting the bolts on from the outside or on the inside. Um, you've got to check your locks as well, because if there's anything showing at all, you know, the cutters will go straight through them. And these people are coming prepared. They know you've got dogs in there and they want them because it means money to them. Every week we're getting between 30 and 40 a day. Not all of them will be stolen, but it does make you question if they don't turn up where they are, if they're chipped, tagged. So they might not have been a witness to be stolen, but again, even if a dog wanders off and you pick it up, that's theft by finding, it's property, you can't keep it. But the police aren't pushing that aspect because I suppose they've got enough as it is without you know, adequate sentencing for the ones that they have witnessed crimes. Um, and quite often, a, a thief will just say, oh, it walked up to me, officer. We've, we've managed to get a lot of cases to court and I think we've only ever had one custodial sentence, just one, and that was years ago. And I think that was because they put something else onto it as well, like violence with it. A theft of the dog is being treated the same as a theft of a mobile phone. In other words, slap wrist, don't do it again. Maybe a fine, maybe some community service. And this is not good enough because what it's doing to people whose dogs have been stolen is part of their family. The distress should be part of this. It's like kidnapping a child to them. It's not going to stop. People are going to keep doing it because it's spread round. It's an easy way to make money. Even if you get caught red-handed, hey, hey, don't worry. You just walk away. We are trying to change that. We've, um, we're have part of SAMPA, Stolen Missing Pets Alliance. And just last week, we were up in Parliament for a debate after we raised 100,000 signatures to actually get the sentencing toughened up and make it a crime in its own right that has to be dealt with and punishment should fit the crime, which it isn't at the moment. And that's the only way this is going to stop if you start getting some high profile cases of people going to prison. And prisoners don't like dog thieves. We had a lot of spate recently of um, dogs being stolen from North Wales. Um, working dogs of all types, you know, border collies, the cocker spaniels, sheep dogs. Um, then all of a sudden they were all dumped. Uh, of course, they didn't realise 
they only had instructions in Welsh. <laughs> you know, no good to an English person, a dog only reacts to Welsh. Dog Lost is a free service. We've got over 122,000 volunteers that will give up their time and help people with missing dogs. We've also got coming up to now 100 regional and local coordinators who leap into action in their area. They put a specific list out in an email to owners of all the places they should be contacting in their area and there's usually quite a lot that people have never thought of or have never heard of. Um, they also coordinate searches, give advice, ring the people up. They become their sort of like support buddy for that time and we're building more and more now up across the country working with other organizations as well uh, we get a great success rate we've probably got 50,000 dogs on there still outstanding we've had helped 80,000 get back though that's one of the perks yep that sometimes you can you get that phone call and you check the photos you check the dates and you think yep definite match only if we're 100 percent then do we phone the owner and I remember doing one on Christmas Eve, and there was a man I'd been talking to for years. Uh, and you get to know quite a few people because, you know, they ring regularly when he news. And I was able to say, look, sit down, what was the best thing you'd like for Christmas? But no, 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 but yeah, 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 no, yeah, oh my God, I just burst into tears, <laughs> you know. Yeah. A lot of people just say, wow, it gives you the faith back in human nature. This is how the internet should be working. You don't just call Dog Lost when a dog is missing. Get in touch if you have information about a dog that may have been stolen. We covered this story in 2011. The good news is that, at last, the government is looking to make stealing dogs a criminal offence with penalties of years in jail. In the meantime, we have doglost.co.uk and its team of volunteers. Thank you, Jane. Next up to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up, some dreamy hunting in Africa. Ali Mufti sends me his new film East Cape Safaris, which is half an hour of him going out after various planes game. Dear Ina Jäger from Germany makes a good montage of his 2018 row rut, including bucks chasing each other around fields and all that makes this time of year so exciting. Staying sausage side, 23 minutes and lots of chat in German, this looks like a long form TV show from Jäger TV. If so, well done and more please. Tom is after Roebuck in one item and then goes to WMS Firearms Training in Wales in the next with the Minox Academy. JJ Casaria makes this promotional film about the dove hunting he offers in Argentina, all filmed in July 2018. Another great new world bird shooting experience is Ducks Unlimited TV 2018 episode 6, which has DU co-host Cara Harper out after ducks in the Arkansas timber. Also in Trumpland, Chad Mendes's Fins and Feathers Carly Pig Hunt is a fun hunting trip for five clients after Central Coast Californian boar. Plenty of spot and stalk action. In New Mexico, CBV TV has a friend called Red Payne over for a mountain lion hunt with hounds. They get nothing, but it's still an enjoyable film with plenty of hound work. And finally, it's the opening of the fallow buck season here in the UK. On the Merton Outdoors channel on the other side of the world in Australia, here is part one with Rob from Fish and Game Taxidermy mounting a buck, which always sounds wrong. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description if you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv well that's it for this week if you haven't done so already please pop over to our website fieldsportschannel.tv you can click to like us there on facebook and on instagram you can follow us on twitter you can subscribe to us on youtube you can pop your email address into our constant contact page our register page and we'll contact you about this show field sports britain it's at 7 p.m uk time every wednesday and you can invest in us go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out how Good to see so many of you at the Game Fair this weekend. Thanks for coming to see me at the Game Fair Theatre. It only remains for me to say good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>